One of the ways that these religious forces uh, and other forces, uh, fundamentalists, are showing is often around, it's around uh, women's rights issues. They want women to stay back in the family, stay home and not bother these uh, forces that are emerging. So the, the struggle took on a different form. It wasn't just women meeting in Nairobi, Cairo, and so forth, but also be able, be capacitated to respond to these other forces that were saying no. There, there, there are people, for example, who say, don't use the word gender because um, um, it means something else than just women. Uh, and this had to do with LGBT, LGBT struggles. So in order to deny that, that right, they would rather that we spoke about women and not gender or gender equality, just talk about women's rights and simplify it to very, very few legal and um, other kind of rights instead of a broad arena of you know, human rights for everybody and so forth. So that we can talk about dawn, but in this period, there were these very reactionary forces that were coming about and uniting around some issues. And the, their unity sometimes has to do with women's rights because it, women's rights, I think, raises issues of fundamental uh, patriarchal institutional forces that make people really uncomfortable. So you see on this issue of gender, the Ayatollahs of Iran, the most reactionary forces in, in, the, in the US, uh, Europe, and other places uniting over it, over it by keeping away certain concepts that even, you know, it just became very clear that you can no longer go and talk about things that we thought we had already accomplished because these other reactionary forces in this neoliberal fundamentalist kind of uh, globe can raise and, and, and set you back. So uh, one of the gains you get by being very active in organizations like Dawn is you can foresee this coming, that you don't innocently go to, uh, for example, right now, uh, Dawn people were represented in the Nairobi conference, which is a follow-up 25 years of ICPD. They would not be surprised about some of the reactionary voices and and trends that are tabled over there because they have seen this accumulated over the years and have been crafting responses towards those kind of uh, reactionary forces that want to limit uh, our issues to a set of really elementary minimalist uh, type of rights rather than the ones that we want as a transformatory possibility. Just a very small part. Yes, sure. yeah. um, so just following on a little bit from Peggy, I think um, I agree that there's, there are regional manifestations that look quite different. But I think what's overall, there is a, there is a process of emboldenment that I think, emboldenment, emboldenment. People become more bold. And I think, yeah. and in, in the Pacific region, this comes through um, sports players who will call out um, homosexuality. So, you know, on its own, may not seem like a very big thing. In the Cook Islands at the moment, we have a very small group of people who want to repeal the homosexual law reform. So very small things, but... Um, but because of this global sense that you can actually call these things out now, the celebrities can, you know, the, the small, some of the people who operate in our in, uh, institutions can. So I think what I'm interested in thinking about, how do we um, counteract a, you know, a right-wing process of emboldenment with a more nuanced and radical one? That's not a good word, isn't it? Em emboldenment. So if anybody can come up with another one, that not would be great. Not just can, but it's your spiritual duty to do so. Yeah. 
that. Yeah, that, yeah, that's right. So, so, so it comes in all sorts of ways, not just the freedom to be able to speak of it, but, it, but you're emboldened to do it because you can yeah. reinterpret mm -hmm. your spiritual um, location with um, a rational, it is rational, um, argument right. to, 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 get, to make your position credible and therefore to allow it to flourish. Right. That's really the attempt to conceptualize what is appropriate, um, not just behavior, but existence. You may, we don't care how you behave. It used to be, don't be so blatant in your pride marches. Now it's not about don't be so blatant in your pride marches, it is don't exist. We don't want you to exist. Or if you exist, please be in a hole quietly somewhere and don't, you know, don't show yourself. So this is all very far from um, both our imaginations of human rights in the, um, of, the 90, of the 1990s, um, however realistic we were at that time, this is certainly not the world we were thinking about, but it's the world we're living in now. We can see there was a really like, a, you know, the, the pushing back on this uh, so-called secular, you know, um, the secular notion of, of women's role and gender role, division of labor, and on, also on the sexuality issues on the body and sexuality. Um, there's many reasons behind, I would say. One is that a China, since, you know, the religion has never been like a dominating, um, you know, ideology. Um, so this is a time when people are trying to, you know, to find out, you know, the spirituality, how that spirituality and that religion at, in that sense play, play a very important role. Uh, because you cannot only thinking about, you know, materials life. You also care about, you know, the other thing that beyond the, just uh, the material. That's why I think um, we can see that people are in search of, the, you know, their spirituality. Um, that's something that inspires them. Um, however, all, many of those values, all this, you know, the, 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 the cultural, the norms, are coming from this, you know, the source of this uh, unchallenged or unquestioned and debated, you know, so-called tradition. And I think it's also somehow being manipulated by some groups as the, as the you know, tools to pushing for their uh, political agenda, pushing for their own interest. For me, um, real. And this is just me, I suppose. But I think in many ways, I think for Dawn as well. Dawn tries to stay relevant by gra what in English we call grasping the nettle. You know, the nettle is sort of tearing, the thorns of the nettle are tearing through your hands. But there is no way not to grasp that nettle. Um, and... Um, we, um, I believe that feminist and women's rights um, organizations, um, uh, other social movements that would consider themselves to be progressive and allies, need to um, grasp the nettle in terms of, so what, of recognizing a few things. This is not a temporary something that's going to go away quickly. Um, that means we have to prepare for the medium haul, maybe the long haul. I didn't say long haul because climate change may take care of the long haul <laughs> completely for us. Um, that we need to be you know, that we need to look what we are facing in the eye. And out of that, then be able to say, all right, what is it that we can do? What is it that we need to do? I have always been a strong believer, even in the 
um, in all my sort of advocacy around sexual and reproductive health and rights, if there was in some of the most depressing and dark times, I've always said that I have a different belief. And that belief comes from the reality of young people. Um, that I don't believe that the majority of young people in the world can go with the right wing's agenda on sexuality and reproduction. That's not their reality. That's not their life. Look at how they live. Look at how they think. This is, they think this is absurd. Now, I'm not saying that there are not young people on the side of the right and so on and so forth. This is extremely complex. And I think that one main challenge for feminism, not just feminisms, but also um, democratic forces, progressive forces, it's to understand that complexity and within that to recognize that although the economic side, huh, the capitalist side of that equation is absolutely structural, that we need to also uh, consider the political or democracy itself as another key piece of the equation, as well as this growth and expansion of forces that come in the form of religion uh, that have this role of restoring hierarchies and creating the South subjects and recreating gender orders. This means to recognize that gender and sexuality gender is at the center of this right-wing shift or this de-democratization shift. But the idea that gender, sexuality, family are important but somehow secondary, lateral, Huh? to structural problems of societies is still there. These are called the cultural wars, huh? as if culture was different from the political economy. Huh? They are called the moral issues. Huh? There's, there's a, even progressive voices tend to extract those dimensions from the structural complexities and threats that we are experiencing now. So a vital something today is to recognize the centrality of that. And I think Brazil is probably the best example huh? uh, to illustrate how this is the case. As we know, the question of the attack on gender, the attack on abortion, the, the, the vicious and virulent attack on feminism was part of the electoral campaign of 2018. Huh? And, and for most observers, many, not most, but many observers, mainstream political analysts, the press, external and internal observers, uh, have considered that to be a campaign rhetoric. This was a discourse in the campaign to inflame huh, the bases, the right-wing bases, but this would wane <laughs> and disappear. Huh? And it has proved not. Huh? Those conceptions about what women are, how they should be, what men are, how families should function, huh? uh, how sexuality is, is something abject huh? or must be disciplined, are at the center of the policies that are installed in the Brazilian states right now, including being translated to international arenas. Huh? And the same is not happening just in Brazil. Brazil, let's say, is, as, as Eric Fasson says, is a sort of uh, 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 terrible laboratory of experiments of uh, the centrality of gender and sexuality uh, as part of a, a conservative and authoritarian formation. Huh? So I think it's important for feminists to keep calling attention to that, huh? 
to remind that, because although this is so glaring in front of us, if you read what's being said, it's not always uh, a underlined and, and, and given the necessary visibility.